Hi, and welcome back to the Complete Web Developer course. We're now on Chapter 5, looking at Bootstrap and Responsive Design. If you're following along with my book, How to Earn $10,000 While Learning to Code, then now is the time to get on to the freelance websites, make a profile for yourself, and start bidding for projects. You've got a good grounding in HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and jQuery now, so you should find that you can do basic website fixes and even put together basic websites. After this chapter, you'll be able to do a lot more in terms of starting from scratch and building great-looking functional websites on your own. So what is Bootstrap? Well, it's put together by the people at Twitter, and it's an open source, completely free web framework to allow you to make good-looking, responsive websites. Now, what do I mean by a responsive website? Well, let's take a look. I'm going to bring up the Bootstrap website, that is getbootstrap.com. Now, responsive design is a key aspect of web development and web design at this stage. So you'll be aware that users use a huge number of different devices to access websites. Increasingly, mobile devices, phones, tablets are being used to um, access the web, and it's your responsibility as a web developer to make sure that your websites appear nicely on every possible device that your users could be using. So that's what responsive design is all about. It's about making a website that it looks good at every screen size. So let's see how Bootstrap does that. If we scroll down here, you can see it looks really nice on this wide screen here. But if I start to narrow the screen, then it actually changes the design a bit. So there you can see the images have got slightly smaller to give them a bit more space on the smaller screen width. If I keep on going, again, at that point, they get smaller so that there's enough space around them and they look good. And then once we move in, we're now at the phone level size and everything has now gone from being horizontally aligned to being what we call stacked. So one above the other. So you could imagine reading that on your phone and it would still look great. So that's what responsive design is all about. It's having a single website design which responds to the screen size of the user and looks good on any device. If you've got a few minutes, have a look at a few websites that you use frequently. Um, try them out on your phone or tablet and try them out on your computer and see if they look different. Most websites these days will have some way of appearing differently on different devices. So we're going to look at Bootstrap. It's not the only way to do responsive design by any means, but it's very widely used, very well respected and very easy to get into. So we're going to see what Bootstrap can do for us in the next few videos. So let's dive right in and get Bootstrap up and running. I'm going to click on my My Websites folder and create a new folder for Chapter 5. We'll call it Bootstrap. Great. Okay, let's bring in the Bootstrap website. I'd definitely recommend taking a few moments to just click around the Bootstrap website and have a good look at it and a read around um, and look at a few examples of websites that have been built with Bootstrap when you have a few moments online. But for now, we'll just look at how to get it set up. So as with jQuery, there's two ways to uh, install Bootstrap. We can download it to our computer and use the files locally, or we can use what's called a CDN, that's a content delivery network, and link directly to the Bootstrap files online. Either way is fine, but because we're focusing on developing offline here, I'm going to show you the download Bootstrap option. So very simple, click the button, I'm going to save the download in my Bootstrap folder. 
Great, that's done. And now if we take a look at what's been downloaded, we've actually got a zip file. So I'm going to double click on that zip file to unzip it. And now what we have is a collection of three folders, so CSS, fonts, and JavaScript. Let's have a quick look at what's in those folders. So we've got a range of different um, bootstrap CSS files to look at there. We won't really need to worry about most of them. The key one is the bootstrap.css file, or indeed the bootstrap.min.css. We saw that with jQuery, that there's a minimized file which just reduces the file size if you don't need to go in and look at and edit the bootstrap code. Here's our fonts file. We'll be looking at glyph icons later on. They're a very useful way to get nice bits of graphics into your websites very easily. And finally, there's a bit of JavaScript as well, just two files, the main JavaScript file and then a minimized version of that file, which is the one that we'll be using. Okay, I'm gonna take these three folders and just copy them over to the main bootstrap folder. There we go, and then I'm going to remove the two original files. So we've just got these three. Great, so we've got our CSS, our fonts, and our JavaScript. Let's get a, an index.html file up and actually get something working. If we switch back over to Chrome and the Bootstrap website, you can see that they actually give you a basic template to get us started. So it looks very similar to the sort of websites that we've been working with so far. It's just got a um, HTML doc type at the top and a header area, title of Bootstrap 101 template. And then we've got a link to the Bootstrap CSS file, the minimized one, a basic header one tag, and then we've got jQuery installed. Bootstrap actually uses jQuery as a base, so you need to have jQuery installed in your page before Bootstrap will work. And then we've got the Bootstrap JavaScript there. So what we're gonna do is copy this, and then we'll switch over to Text Wrangler create a new file, paste in our code, there it is, and then we'll just save as bootstrap index.html. Great, there it is. Just have a quick check, the links are all in the correct folder, so it's css slash bootstrap.min.css, that's where it is on our installation, and similarly with the JS. So everything should work nicely. Let's get rid of that, and resize Chrome, and then we'll open this up in our web browser. There it is. So it doesn't look like much as yet, but you can see that Bootstrap is, uh, the CSS at least, is installed because we've got this nice font here and a slightly off black. Stylistically, it's generally considered better to have a slightly off black, so a dark gray rather than black as your primary text color on your website. It just looks a little bit nicer, a little bit less stark. Great, so now we've got Bootstrap installed. Let's dive in a little bit deeper and see what we can do with it. So how does responsive design with Bootstrap actually work? Well, we use something called the grid system. I'm gonna scroll down the Bootstrap docs here. And if at any point in this video you want a little bit more detail, just pause the video and have a read of the Bootstrap docs. I'll give you an overview, um, but they've got a bit more detail there if you, if you need it. Um, I'll start off by talking about media queries. You'll notice that when we did that exercise of making the screen smaller, there were points at which everything changed. So at this point, nothing is really changing. It's just getting wider and wider. 
and then at some point it snaps and changes into a different layout. So those points are known as breakpoints. And in Bootstrap, you've got four different areas or four different screen sizes with three breakpoints. And you can see what those breakpoints are here. We've got 768 pixels, so that defines a tablet or a phone, something small. Um, and then above that, you get a larger tablet, maybe a ta tablet in desktop orientation um, or a small desktop. And then you've got 992 pixels and upwards is a standard desktop. And then 1200 pixels and upwards is a large desktop. So you've got these four types of devices, four screen sizes, and those breakpoints, the 768, 992, and 1200, are the number of pixels that define the gaps between those devices. So when we switch from what we consider to be a phone to a tablet, and then from a tablet to a desktop, and then from a desktop to a large desktop. So essentially what Bootstrap is doing is applying different CSS, different styles, to the different screen sizes. And the main way it does that is with grids. So if we just switch back up here. Um, the grid system is very widely used. It's beyond Bootstrap. There are many other grid systems that you can use. You can create your own grid systems. But most grid systems use 12 columns because they allow you to then create different sized chunks of text or content within that, depending on how you want to split the screen up. So let's scroll down and get a quick example. So here, for example, we've got 12 different columns. Don't worry about the col-md1, we'll see what that means in a minute. But essentially we've got 12 different columns with a tiny bit of content in each. If I then make that screen smaller, they switch down. So that was the 768 breakpoint there, the phone breakpoint. And when we make the screen smaller than that, we've then got stacked divs rather than horizontally laid out divs. And similarly with the the next line, we've got eight and four there. So we've got a column which is eight little columns wide, and we've got a column which is four little columns wide. Below that, we've got three columns of equal width. But for all of those, when we bring them down below that 768 breakpoint, they become stacked. So that's a good basic way to get a decent layout on every device. So let's try and implement that ourselves. We'll switch back over to our Bootstrap 101 template. and open my file. There we go. So how can we implement this grid system? We'll keep the Hello World H1 for the moment. Let's just switch back over to the Bootstrap Docs and take a quick look at this. So we put our rows into a container div and then each row will then have a row class and another class which gives it a an idea of how how wide that row is so let's take a look at the code here you can see we've got a div class of row there and then lots of or in this case 12 little divs within that so let's start by recreating one of those we'll keep the simple one at the moment we'll look at this bottom one which is just two equal sized divs so first We'll create our container class, which contains everything within. And then we're going to create a row. And then within that row, we'll create a div with a class of CLMD6. and we'll just put some content in there. 
Now, if you're wondering what the MD stands for, it stands for medium sized desktop or medium device, sorry, which is desktops. You can use different class prefixes depending on whether you're focusing on extra small devices, the phones, or the small devices, the tablets, the medium devices, or the large devices. Generally speaking, to keep things pretty simple, we can focus on the medium devices and we don't need to do anything particularly specific to work for phones unless we want to do something away from the norm. So let's go back to here. So we have our content there. I'm just copying and pasting that to get another one. So let's have a look. So at the moment our content divs are stacked because we're below the 768 pixels. If we then stretch it out, you can see now we're getting a bit of padding because we're going into the, the tablet zone. And then once we go above the next breakpoint, we're now splitting into two 50% divs. Great. Now we can make that a little bit clearer by perhaps giving these a box class as well and then just styling that so we can see the background as well. So let's just give it a background color of a nice light gray, D3, 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 that'll do it. And we'll have a border of 1px solid gray. So you can see these divs are being stretched right to the edges of the screen there. And they've also got a nice little bit of padding within them. And then now we're in the tablet area, so they're still stacked, but there's a nice bit of padding either side, or a nice margin either side. And now they've split into two 50% divs, which then change slightly in terms of their padding when we get to that last extra large breakpoint. Great. So let's just play around with this a little bit and create, create one more row. In fact, I'll give you a quick challenge. Can you change this content? So instead of having two even divs, we've got three even divs. I hope you managed it. All we need to do is copy a third div in there and then change our number of columns on our class to four. Let's just get rid of our previous ones there. So there's our three divs and then they stretch out nicely. So the three div is a very common one on things like landing pages and home pages because it allows you to give a nice bit of content, possibly with an image on the top, um, or a reason why to use your product or app or whatever it might be. And then that does break down very nicely onto mobiles and smaller tablets. So that's how a responsive grid system works in Bootstrap. I definitely recommend playing around with that a little bit yourself and trying out different widths of columns. And indeed, if you want to go into it in a bit more detail, read the Bootstrap docs. There's a lot more you can do with this that I'm not going to go into in great detail. But if you want to, to learn more about responsive design, I definitely recommend it. Then have a look at the Bootstrap docs there and try things out for yourself. So another one of the great things about Bootstrap is that they have a number of templates that you can use to see what you can achieve with Bootstrap very easily and to get an idea about how it all fits together, how the CSS works, etc. We're going to have a quick look at those and then we're going to create a navbar. 
So let's have a quick look at the templates. So there they are. You can see they all look pretty nice, pretty nicely labelled and set out. If we have a quick look at the Jumbotron there, we'll be looking at that in more detail later, but it's a really nice clean design or layout for a website. You've got the nav bar at the top, the navigation bar. You've got a nice login form there, um, a clear bit of marketing text at the very top, a nice call to action, that good blue button there, and then our three columns that of course collapse down when we need them to for smaller devices. Okay, so we're going to concentrate on the, the nav bar at the moment, and we're going to create um, a little nav bar for our website, which is going to have a title on the left, and then a few links for the main page. And it's going to be nice and collapsible, as this one is. When you drag it in, you can see this little box appears with a menu icon on it, when you don't have room for that login form on your screen, instead you click on that button and then the login form comes in there. So it's really nice, really nicely done. Okay, so let's see how we do that. Switch back over to our Bootstrap template. And then let's create our nav bar. Right, well we start with the div. And that div has a class initially of navbar. Now we're going to put a second class in here, which will be a class that summarizes the design of our navbar. And this is a quite common theme in Bootstrap. You have an initial class which tells the, the browser or the CSS what type of a thing we're dealing with here. So in this case, a navbar. And then you have a second class which says what type of design we want or coloring or layout or some aspect which specifies in more detail how we want this element to look. So at the moment, we'll start with navbar default, which is the default navbar layout. Let's close the div and just see what that looks like completely on its own. So there you can see all we've got so far is a, a default navbar, which looks quite a lot like the one that we created at the end of the jQuery chapter for our code player site. I'll just show you one other default styling is navbar inverse. So that's where you have a black background and a white text. So we'll stick with default for now. Great. And then within that div, we have another div, which is our container div. Now we can either use container or container-fluid, depending on whether we want to base our site around a fixed width template or a fluid template. Uh, it doesn't really matter at this stage, we'll just go for container to keep it simple. Now we're going to have two areas that make up our navbar. We're going to have a navbar header area, which will be on the left and will contain our logo, or in this case, just a bit of text. And then we're going to have a navbar collapse area, which is where the other menu items are going to go. So that will be to the right of our main area over there. And the nice thing about the navbar collapse area is it will do what this menu does up here that when we go nice and small, like on our mobile devices, then it collapses down into a navbar button, which when you press it, you get the navbar in a little drop down menu like that. So it's really neat. Okay, let's see how we do that. So let's start by doing our navbar header. Very straightforward. So we put in a div with a class of navbar header, close that div, and then in that div we have a link, so an A with an href, and we'll just leave the href blank for now, and we give this a class of navbar brand, and that's the class that we give to our logo or whichever text we're going to use for the logo area of the site. 
and for now we'll just call it my website. You can use whatever you like there. See what that looks like? Nice. So it's very nicely laid out, given good, um, good padding and nicely centered and everything like that. And again, if we change the type of the navbar class, then everything changes the color of the the um, navbar brand area and the background. So it's really easy to, to re-theme your site and to give it a very different color scheme. Now let's build the other area of the navbar that's going to contain our links to other pages on our site. So we have another div. We're going to call this one a collapse. We're going to give it a class of collapse and that means that it will collapse when we go into the less than 768 pixels breakpoint that is the phones and small tablets and it will collapse into a nice little button which will allow us to uh, drop, drop down the menu. Okay, and we need another whoops, another class of nas, navbar collapse to give it the correct behavior for our navbar. So that will contain all our other links. And then within that, we're going to have a UL, so an unordered list. And we're going to give this a class of nav because it's a nav UL. And another class of navbar dash nav to give it a particular style that makes it work very well with the with the navbar collapse the drop down okay and then we'll close that unordered list and now we'll bring in our links as list items so we'll have an li and they'll all be links and we'll just call the first one page one And then we'll copy and paste those to give us page two and page three. Now, if we have a look at that, there they are. Nice. And again, they're nicely formatted and they've got a nice, when you mouse over the color changes, makes it clear that you're about to click on that particular link. Now, what you'll notice though, is that the, the nav doesn't, doesn't exist yet, the collapse. So when, we go down to below 768 pixels, there isn't this button here. So how do we bring that in? Well, that's actually a little bit complicated. So what I'm gonna do is paste the code in, and then we'll look at it and explain what's going on with that code. Let's just run it and make sure it works first. There's our nice button. And when we click on it, the menu expands or contracts. Great, so what have we actually got there? We've got a button, so we're defining a particular button, and then this has a class of navbar toggle, obviously because that's what it's doing. And then it's got a data toggle of collapse, so we know what it's doing. It's collapsing and expanding the, um, the, the list items down here. And the data target is the navbar collapse class which is the class of the div which contains all the links. So that's what links this particular button to this particular div. And then within that button, we've got, um, this is a class for screen readers. So if someone is reading your website on a screen reader, they can see that even if they don't have this um, nice image there, that they can press that button to toggle the navigation. And then the image is actually made up of three separate icons. If I get rid of those two, you can see how that works. So that's only one icon there. So this icon bar is just that straight line across there. So then if we add another one of those, we've got two, add a third, and we've got all three. So we make up the traditional settings or menu bar option icon. Great, so that's our button. 
So we've created a collapsible nav bar there, which works really nice on any screen size. The only other thing I'm going to show you before we stop is that you might want to give one of your pages a highlight to show that that's the page that the user is currently on. That's easy enough. You just give it a special class of active. And that link will, will be highlighted. If we have a look in the, the expanded view, you can see it's very clear that that's the page that you're currently on. And it works just as well in the collapsed view as well. If we bring that down, then the page is highlighted. And before we finish, let's just see how that all looks in the different theme of nav navbar default. Great. So it all works nice and looks good, but it's just got a different kind of softer theme when we change that to default. So I would definitely recommend having a play around, creating a menu of your own. Have a look at the bootstrap docs and you'll see that there's a lot more you can do with menus. You can put the login forms in there, search boxes, whatever you want. So definitely have an experiment, play around and post your results in the forum and I'll take a look. So now that we've got our navbar, we're going to look at some of the central HTML structures and how they work in Bootstrap. So we'll start with forms and then later on in the video we'll look at tables. Now just before we do that, everything in Bootstrap that's in the main page content should be in a div called container. Like that. And I'll just show you the difference. Let's have a look and see what happens if you put something outside a container. So let's say we've got an H1 our bootstrap page. So if we just put that not in a container, then you can see it goes right up to the edge there and doesn't respond at all to the different screen size. If we put it in a container, however, we get a nice bit of padding and a little bit of padding at the top there um, as well, and it responds nicely to larger screens, it sort of moves in and moves in with the rest of the screen as you can see there. So that's the advantage of putting everything into a container. So let's keep our h1 tag, why not? And then as a quick bit of revision for you, can you remember how to create a form in HTML and put a single tag, it will we'll have an input tag with a type of text. Go for it. Okay, I hope you managed it. Pretty straightforward to put a form in. We just open the form with a form tag and then close the form at the end there. And then for our single input tab, we put input. I'm going to put type equals text. Text is the default type, so we don't really need to do that. But um, it's nice to clarify what type you want it to be and then We'll close it. That's the sort of minimal markup that we need to create a form with a single input. So you can see there, it looks a little bit nicer maybe than the forms that we had before. It's a slightly, it's a, um, a grey rather than a black and the padding is slightly different, but basically that's the same. So how can we get this looking a little bit nicer and actually using the, the bootstrap CSS classes? Well, firstly, each of the inputs in a bootstrap form is surrounded by a div which has a specific class of form group. So we'll just put that all in there and then close the div. And we usually want to have a label. So this will be attached to our input and Although we didn't look at labels specifically before, they're particularly useful in Bootstrap because Bootstrap will align your labels nicely to the form. So rather than just using a bit of text saying username or something like that, it's much better to do it as a label because then Bootstrap will understand what it is and align it nicely for you. So we'll say label and why not have username as our label. Okay, we're almost there. 
we need to add a class to the input of form control. So that's just a kind of element within the form, essentially. And let's now take a look at that and see how that looks. Okay, so a lot nicer. You can see it's aligned it nicely. It's giving it some nice um, rounded corners there. And it's also stretched it out to the whole of the page. Now remember here we're effectively looking at the mobile version because the screen size is so narrow. If we stretch it out, then you can say it does deal with that really nicely. Stretches out all the way to the end of the form. Um, just a couple of other things. We should really give our input a name so we have something to deal with. So let's call it username. And when we do that, we can then link up the label for the username to that particular input. And that's particularly useful for things like accessibility. If someone's using a screen reader to read this, then they'll know that those two connect up. It doesn't actually change anything in terms of the layout of our page, but it's good semantically, it's good for your code, and it's good for accessibility. Okay, another quick challenge for you then. Can you create a, another field directly underneath that one called password, which will have a type of password? I hope that wasn't too tricky. It's just a matter of copying and pasting this code and then essentially changing everything to password. So let's have a new label and the label is going to be for password. The name of our new field is going to be password and the type is also password. Let's have a look at that. So you can see these forms are really nicely laid out. There's a good bit of padding, spacing. They're, they're very pleasant to look at. And of course, that does the usual. It doesn't show your characters that you've typed. Now, as this is becoming a kind of login form, let's have a little checkbox at the bottom for keeping the user logged in. That is creating a cookie. They look slightly different. The construction for a checkbox is a little bit different. So what we do is class is equal to checkbox this time not form group. Close the div. And this time the label actually surrounds the input. So we have label and then close label there and then the input type equals checkbox goes there and our label keep me logged in goes after it. So it's slightly different than what you might expect for checkboxes, but you can see that still displays really nicely and everything's moving back and forth. Okay, so the last thing we need in our form is a submit button. And we can either do that with an input or with a button. I'm gonna go with an input for now. Either way is fine though. So we'll stick with that. We don't want a label for this input. So the type is submit. This one's going to have a value of login. And we'll give it a name of login. And instead of a form control class, we're going to use a button class because we want a button out of this. So we're going to use btn to tell Bootstrap that we want it to be a button. And we're going to use the default button class. So that's button default. Whoops, spell that right. Okay, let's take a look. So nice. So we've got a nice button there with a hover over effect, etc. So a really good looking form there. Very, very easy to create. A couple of other things about forms before we look at tables. Um, if we change the actual form class to form dash inline, then we get an inline form. Let's see how that looks differently to what we had before. You can see in the mobile version, it doesn't look any different. It still displays it the same way, but if it has enough room, then it will actually put it all onto one line. So that's particularly useful, say, in the navbar or somewhere where you want to preserve vertical space and keep everything into a single single line. Obviously, you don't want it in a single line if there isn't enough room to display it. So that's why it changes to the normal form layout for a mobile version. 
What if you still want it to look essentially like this, but you want the username and password to be on the left of the form input rather than above it? Again, very easy to do. You just change the class to form horizontal. Let's take a look at that. And the last thing I'm going to show you is the different types that you can have on a bootstrap form for the inputs. So if we get rid of type equals text, for example, let's say we want to have a date input. So we can change the type to date and we get by default a, a nice date there. We can actually use a date picker. We don't have to create any code for that at all. It's all automatically in there. Or we can type it in directly. Etc. So really handy, just by adding the word date, you get all of this functionality nicely put in there. If you want to have an email address, then you can just put type is equal to email. And that looks exactly the same, but then we'll get a message. And it even gives you a nice friendly message that works out what's missing in the user's email address. If we then put in a correct email address or correct ish, it'll submit fine. So I'm not going to go into forms in any more detail than that. In the getbootstrap.com website, you'll see a lot more detail on forms and a few other things that you can do and a bit of information about other form elements like text areas, radio buttons, etc. But this, this will do for an introduction and then you can play around a bit on your own with the information on the getbootstrap.com website. Okay, so that's forms. Now let's take a look at tables. So once again, quick challenge for you. Can you create a simple HTML table with a couple of rows of data, maybe about you and your siblings? I'm sure you remembered how to do that. I'm going to do it like this. So table and close table. Notice I've put it inside the container div. And then I'm just going to put my rows as single rows. Um, so this will be my heading, so we'll just have name. And age. That will do for now. And then a normal row. Have Rob. Try and get this right. And 33 and then I'm going to copy that twice sister Helen is 29 and my sister Sarah is 35 and did you spot the deliberate errors in my code there let's change those to TDs and let's fix that and also fix this. Excellent. Hopefully you made fewer mistakes in your table. So let's have a look. So you can see we've got a slightly nicer version than our standard HTML table. Um, we've got the, the nicer font and the slightly nicer sort of gray colors, but it basically looks the same. So how do we apply our lovely bootstrap formatting? All we need to do is add a class of table. And then when we refresh that, look at that, a lot nicer. So it's stretching out nicely to the end of the end of the page or the end of the container to be specific. Um, and it's added a lot of padding, very nice. And if we stretch that out, it continues to look nice all the way through. Fantastic, so there's not that much more to look at with tables, but there's a couple of things that I'll just show you. One of them is the table striped class. So if we run that, you can see it's alternating the stripes. So you've got a slightly different background on um, the alternate, alternate rows, which is really nice if you've got some longer tables with a lot of information in. We can easily add a nice border by using table bordered as a class. Let's see. So just got a nice neat border around the edge. And finally, we can add classes specifically to rows 
So let's add a class equals active. Uh, sorry, let's go for a success class on my row, and then that gives me a nice green sort of color. And let's go for, no offense meant, but let's go for a danger class on Sarah's TD. And there we go. So we've highlighted those particular rows or cells within the table. So once again, check out getbootstrap.com for full details of how to play around with tables and other functions and features that you can get in. But this is just a, a quick primer to using forms and tables within Bootstrap. In this video, we'll take a look at some of the components that come with Bootstrap that make creating key elements of your site much, much easier. We'll start by looking at the glyph icons that we saw very briefly earlier on. So if we click on components over here. So the glyphs are little icons like that that can be used all over your site just to add a little bit of interaction for the user and something something nice to look at beyond just plain text. So let's see how we use those. It's pretty straightforward. All you need to do is use a span with a certain class of glyph icon and then you state which glyph icon, which glyph icon you want to use. So let's take a look and see how that works. So we'll get rid of our form and our table. There we go. Okay, so I've got a nice plain HTML page. Um, so we just bring in a span and we give it a class of glyph icon. And then the second class will be whichever glyph icon we want. So let's start with a search, see how that looks. There it is. So you can imagine that could go very nicely up here, possibly in the navbar alongside an input button. But also, it's becoming increasingly common to use them as actually bits of graphics on your website because you can scale them up however you like. So let's give this one a class of large. And then in our style, We'll change the CSS to give it a font size of 400%. So you can see it scales up really nicely. In fact, we can go much bigger than that, 800%. These are icons, they're fonts. So they scale up as large as you want them. They'll never go blocky, in fact. Let's make it really big. You can see that it still looks really good. And let's try just a couple of others. We'll have a look at the magnet. There it is. Great. And indeed, the calendar. Really nice icons there. And you can, of course, color them because they're just fonts. Very simply, just change the color and they'll have a certain color there and you can change the background color as well like that so you've got it within a certain background let's get rid of that now another thing we can do with these icons is bring them in to our inputs so we can make nice looking buttons or nice looking forms. So for example, let's create a form group with an just plain text input in it. Give it a go. Did you remember how to do it? We just use div with a class of input group. Close that div, and then an input 
with a class of form control. We'll give it a type of text. It doesn't need to have a name. Now here is where we can put our glyph. So span class equals glyph icon glyph icon. Let's have a look and pick one to use. Maybe we'll use the comment icon close the span. And then we give it a third class of input group add-on and now you can see that the little glyph icon there has become an add-on to the main text of the input. You can actually put anything you like there, it doesn't have to be a glyph. So if you wanted to put in an email address for example, whoops, you can do that there. Or if you wanted to do currency, then you could maybe put 0 .00. It wouldn't make much sense to have that at the beginning. So just paste that, put it at the end, and then Bootstrap will put a nice 0 .00 for your pound or whatever it might be. So that's a great way to make your forms a little bit more exciting. We can also put our glyphs into buttons. And to do that, let's first create our button. So I'll do that as a little challenge for you. Can you create a button with a success class? So a nice green button. Hopefully you did something like button. We can add a type equals button. You don't actually need that, but it's good to have. And then class equals btn for button and then btn dash success to make it green. And then we just put our glyph icon in there. So if I copy this one, and then close the button, then we get a nice green button with just the calendar icon. But I could also add the word calendar afterwards and then you've got this really nice looking button which looks great. Okay so that's enough on glyph icons for the moment. We're now going to have a look at alerts. So alerts are something you're going to want to use in your websites quite frequently when you have a success so someone signed up to your mailing list or they've created an account or whatever it might be or a danger message if they're about to delete something or even a warning message to warn them that what they're about to do is reasonably significant. So we can do those very easily with Bootstrap. Let's find out how. So underneath our button, we'll just create a new div with a class of alert. Again, this is the type of div that we're creating. And then if we want a success alert, then we just create an alert success class. Close that div and then we'll have some text inside. You've done it. See how that looks? Nice. So a very nicely styled but easy to use um, success div. We can also have a danger div. That will have the red. The you've done it has slightly different connotations when it's, um, when it's a danger div. We can add another class to make it dismissible. So just alert dismissible like that. Once we've added our dismissible alert, we just add a button onto the div. And again, we'll have a type of button and we give it a class of close and that will make it responsible for closing this div. And the thing that it's going to close is an alert. Okay, and then we'll just put a little X there and close the button. Let's have a look, there it is. So it appears very nicely there and when we click it, it closes the div. So that's alerts. 
Now let's look at list groups and badges. So list groups are just a class that we give to a UL, but it displays it in a really nice way. Let's have a look. So we just have a UL with a class of list group. Close that UL. And then we'll have an item and we give it a class of list group item. Call that item one. And then let's just make a couple more. Two, three, four. See what that looks like. Okay, so really nicely formatted list there. Again, with a good bit of padding, everything looks really nice. Now we can add a badge to those items. What do I mean by a badge? Well, let's take a look. We'll add a span with a class of badge. And maybe give it a number. Close the span. That would help if I actually put it inside the list item. There it is. So how you can imagine this might work is if you've got, say, something like an email client or a messaging app, you could have an inbox with 12 items in it. You could have sent items. with four items in it, etc., etc. So it's a quite commonly used layout to have your various different areas of your site and then the number of bits of information or emails or whatever it might be on the right. So that's just an overview of some of the components installed with Bootstrap. If you want to take a look at a few more, and I strongly recommend you do, have a look at the Bootstrap site and just see how they all work. So you've got things like the Jumbotron, um, the, what are the other things worth looking at? Progress bars are very commonly used. Panels I find very useful as well, particularly the nice contextualized plan, um, panels with the colors there, a great way of laying out content in a clear and attractive way. So take a look at it in more detail in your own time, and I'll see you in the next video. So in the next couple of videos, we're going to look at some of the JavaScript components that come with Bootstrap, which allow you to add even more interactivity to your websites. The first one we're going to look at is the modal. So I'll firstly just show you what a modal window is. I'm sure you've come across them. It's something like that. So just a simple pop-up essentially, which blocks off the background content and gives your user maybe a login form or a bit of information or something that you want to really bring their attention to. So these are really easy to put together with Bootstrap. Let's find out how we do it. So let's clear out our Bootstrap file. Just nice and clean. Great. Okay, so to introduce a modal, what we do is we have a div, and unsurprisingly, we give it a class of modal. Now that will, by default, make that div not actually show. So if I put some content in there, you can't actually see it because the modal, by default, is hidden, and it will only pop up when you press the button or do whatever it is that you want the user to do for the modal to appear. So we won't actually be able to see anything until we make this modal live. So we've um, created our modal. We need to give it an ID so it can refer to, or so that we can refer to it in our code. So we'll call it my modal for the moment. Keep it very simple. And then we'll just create a quick button which will link to that modal and make it pop up so we can see what's going on. So we'll give it a class of button and we'll call it a button success, so a nice green link. And now these are the key bits of code that we need. We need a data toggle and we set that equal to modal. So that states that we want this button to toggle, i.e. bring up the modal window.
and then we need to give it a data target and that will be the ID of the modal that we've created and that we want to pop up. So of course you might have more than one modal on a particular page and this is how you refer to the one that you want. And then we'll just have some text launch modal and we'll close our button. So that's a very basic bit of code. So it launches the modal, but of course there's nothing actually there to launch. So you can see it's had that effect, but it's not actually loading anything because we need to add a bit more code into our modal. So what we do is we have a container div for our modal content, which we call modal dialog. So a dialog box is essentially another word for a modal. So that's our container div for our modal content. And then we have another div within that called modal content. All of these divs are essentially required for Bootstrap to make everything display nicely. We can have a quick look at that, see how that looks. Still empty at the moment because we don't have any content in there. Okay, so we have three parts to a modal. We'll start with the modal header, which of course goes at the top. And then within that, we need a button to close the modal, first of all. So we'll have a simple button, and we'll give it a class of close. Remember, we had the same class when we had the button to close the alert box in the last video. And then this time we need a data dismiss Oops, dismiss of modal. Last time it was an alert because we were dismissing the alert. And we'll use the X symbol again. But you can use anything you like there. Okay. So that's our button to dismiss the modal the modal. And then we'll have a title. Usually H4 is the about the right size for a modal title. So we'll have an H4 and we'll give it a class of modal title. And we'll give it just some basic text there. Okay. And then I'll just tab that in. We'll close our modal header div. So now we should actually be able to see something when we click on that. Great, so all we've got so far is a title, my modal, and an X, which then closes it down. Notice you can click anywhere else and that will also close the modal. So it's nice, nicely featured. Okay, so that's the first part of our modal, the title. Now we want the main section of the modal, which we call the modal body. So div class equals modal body. What a fantastic modal. Okay, and now let's see how that looks like. Great, so we've got a nice title and we've got our fantastic modal content as well. All right, the third part of the modal is the footer. So let's put that in. Usually we use the footer to put in some buttons to either confirm what they want to do or to cancel or something like that. So we'll put in a couple of buttons. So this one will have a class of button and then a button default. So just a blue button and this one's going to dismiss the modal. So we add the data dismiss equals modal, exactly the same as we had for the little X up there. And then we just want some text of close. And then we'll have another button for doing whatever it is that we want to do, or the user might want to do when this modal pops up. So we want a button success for this one. 
and so we need save changes okay let's see what that looks like really nice so that's a really great modal um, so modals are a great way to alert the user to either log in or do something else or to bring an important message to them one other thing that I'm going to show you before we stop this video is to change the size of the modal in the modal dialog div you can add an extra class of modal SM if you want a particularly small modal so let's see what difference that makes so we've now got a, a nice little modal notice that if we make this small it doesn't actually make any difference on the phone screen size so on the phone you still get this full size modal which is probably what you want but in some cases you might just want a small alert message and then on a full screen the small modal does a lot of good The last bootstrap component that I'm going to show you is a very useful one called Scroll Spy. Now this allows you to have sections of your website or the whole website where when the user scrolls the icons at the top change to show whereabouts the user is in the website. So it's really useful particularly if you've got um, a single page website which is really long and has lots of different sections then this will show the user where they are in that website at any one time. So let's see how it works. I'm going to get rid of all my other content here. In fact, I'll keep the nav bar. So I'll get rid of everything other than the hello world and the container. So first of all, let's build in a bit of content. So I'm just going to have a div with an ID of div1. And a little bit of content in there and then close that div and then I'll have div 2 and div 3 just like that okay and then I'm gonna add some styles so my div 1 will give div 1 a background color of blue We'll give oops, div2 a background color of red and div3 a background color of green and we'll give all the divs a height of 800 pixels. So let's just see how that looks there we go we've got a nice uh, I've given the, the nav bar a height of 800 pixels there as well that's fine um, and there's blue green there okay I think I'll just give these a class so that we have a reasonably sized nav bar we'll give them a content div class and then we can give content div the height instead of general divs and that will keep everything a little bit smaller put a dot there and all is well okay great now scroll spy is no use if the header part of the document disappears when the user scrolls down so we can fix that very easily with bootstrap we just take our navbar div and give it a class of navbar fixed top and that will fix the navbar to the top of the page no matter where the user is so that can be really useful if you want to keep your navigation bar login area etc visible at all times so now how do we integrate the scroll spy it's pretty straightforward we need to link up our navigation with the divs so for that first one there we can change the href to div1 and the second and third I've actually already done so we've got an internal link there to div1, div2 and div3 
So let's just see that in action. So page two, it links to the red div, page three, the green div, page one, the blue div. So our links are all working nicely. So all we need to do to integrate scroll spy is add an extra couple of tags to the body and they are data spy is equal to scroll and data target now this is going to be the class or the ID of the div which contains our navbar links that we want to update as the user scrolls down so in our case it's this one here that we want sorry that that one there the div there so we could either use collapse or navbar collapse I'm going to go for navbar collapse just in case we were to use another collapse div somewhere else we could of course also give that div a particular ID if we wanted to be really sure we weren't going to get any other ones so navbar collapse so now let's see this in action so now when the user scrolls down when he reaches page 2 you can see that page 2 is now highlighted and now page 3 is highlighted so you may have noticed that single page websites are becoming increasingly popular particularly for things like landing pages to stop the user having to reload the page and click somewhere to see some more information the user just scrolls down and sees everything that they might want to know about the particular app or website or tool or whatever it might be so this internal navigation structure with scroll spy makes that all work really nicely you can still jump to sections of the website but you can also scroll there congratulations on making it to the end of the bootstrap section of this course let's just take a moment to see how much you've covered you've been introduced to bootstrap and the basics of responsive design and you've installed Bootstrap onto your website and set up a grid system so that your website responds to the size of the user's device. Then we looked at some of the CSS components of Bootstrap and looked at how we can create really nice looking navigation bars, forms and tables. And then we went on to look at the other components in Bootstrap. And finally, we looked at a bit of JavaScript with Bootstrap, with modals and alerts and scroll spy. Now, in this challenge, you're going to create from scratch your very own landing page. So I'd love you to have in mind some kind of app. It may be one that you've already written or it may be one that you'd like to write. An app or website or idea for a business in general. And we're going to put together a landing page for that website. You've probably already come across the concept of a landing page. Essentially, it's a page where you want to send anyone who's interested in your app that gives them a bit of information about the app, um, looks great, and either signs them up on their on their mailing list or gets them to download the app or log in or sign up or whatever it is that you want them to do so I suggest that you go away and you use the Twitter bootstrap skills that you've learned and try and come up with something fantastic um, but you're very welcome to watch me create my page so this is just a kind of demo landing page that I've put together and I'm going to create this step by step in the next few videos so whatever you come up with, please do post links to it in the forum. I'd love to have a look. So let's get cracking with our bootstrap landing page. I'm going to start by putting together the navigation. So I've got my bootstrap template in front of me here. And your first challenge then is to try and come up with a basic navigation bar across the top and have your brand and a small collection of links. So just two or three links on the left hand side of the navigation menu. Off you go. I hope you managed that. I'll just talk you through how I think you should have done it. So we start off with a div with a class of 
navbar and we'll give it a navbar default styling and then we have a container within that I'll just close those divs so a container and then we have our navbar header There it is. And then we're going to need our button, which we use if the screen size is, is so small that we need to um, have the menu as a drop down. So it's a class of navbar toggle. And the data toggle is collapse and data target is well we'll leave that blank for the moment because we don't have a data target yet and then we'll put in our spans for our icon bar There we go, and another one of those, and then we'll close our button. And then we'll have our navbar brand, and I'm just going to call it my app. You can use whatever you like as the title there. Okay, then we close the navbar header div. And now we want our navbar collapse area. Sorry, I mean div with a class of collapse and a, another class of navbar collapse. We'll just close that div there and in fact we can use that as our data target. Great. And then we have our UL which is going to be our unordered list for all our links and that has a class of nav and then a secondary class of navbar nav. Now we have all of our LIs. Now I'm going to have home. Oh, I'll put it in a href is going to be my home div. And home and that will be selected by default so we want class equals active there. Then we'll have another one, which will be about. And then my third is going to be for downloading the app on the App Store. So we'll call it download. Let's go and fill in these. So we want an about and I download the app. Okay, let's take a look at that. Nice, looks pretty good. I think I'm going to make the My App text a little bit larger. That's easy enough to do. So just create some styling up the top there and then navbar brand. We want to style to Let's try font size 1.2 em, a little bit larger, great, maybe one more. Okay, I like that. And we've got our drop down menu, and we'll just close the list and take a look. Looks good, yep, I'm liking that, very nice. Okay. 
So that's our navbar. Now this time I wanted to add in a login form as well, just so that we can try that out and see how it works. So the way we bring in a login form is after our UL, but still within our collapse area because we want the login form to collapse as well. Then we have a form and we give it a class of navbar form because it's a form in the navbar and we want to bring it over to the right. So navbar dash right will do that for us. Great, and then within that form we just create a form in the normal way. So class equals form group and then we want input and we'll have a type of email. Give it a placeholder of email and a class of form control. Close that there. Notice having the placeholder there actually saves us from having a label. So when we're running out of time, running out of space, we don't want to um, put lots of labels in. So if we can put them inside the actual input themselves, then that solves the problem. Then we'll have a password, placeholder of password, still got class of form control. Great, and lastly we'll have a button, which will be our submit button. And we'll give it a class of BTN and BTN success. We'll have a login. Great, and then we just close that form. Oops. There we go. Let's take a look. So when we click down there, we've got a really nicely laid out login form. And then up here, that still looks really good. Okay, fantastic. Now let's look at the background image that I want to use. Uh, when finding stock images, there's a really good blog article that I found a while ago that I'll um, link to in the notes. But that has a great deal of different sites that you can go to to find free but high quality stock images. And I had a quick look through those and I found this image, which I thought was really nice. I'm going to use this one as the background. So all I did was click download and then took the large version and then right clicked and save image as. Okay. So, well, one thing before we do that, I do want to make my navbar fixed. So we'll add the navbar fixed top class to the navbar. Great. Okay, so let's have our first container. Class equals container. Close that div. And this container, we want to have a the background of the image. So let's give it a particular ID. Call it top container. And then top container is going to have a background image, so background image of a URL and that will be, I've saved it as background.jpg. Let's take a look. We'll, we'll give it a height temporarily as well so we can see what's going on. Okay, nice. There it is. But we want it to spread all the way to the bottom of the screen. So a nice way to do that is to use a little bit of JavaScript. We saw something similar. Let me just bring up the bottom of that window for you. We saw something similar when we did our jQuery project. 
So here's a quick test for you. Can you set the height of the image to be equal to the height of the window? All right, I hope you did something like selected top container. CSS height and then set that equal to the window height. Take a look at that. Great. Now you'll notice that we've got a bit of padding around the edge of the image there. I don't really want that. So I'm going to set the width of the top container to 100%. That should stretch out the image. Now, you'll notice also that we haven't actually got all of the image there. So there's a nice CSS trick that we can use to get that working better. And that's using the cover background size. So let me show you how that works. We just set the background size attribute to cover. And now you can see it's scaled it all nicely for us. And the really nice thing about that is it does flash, unfortunately, when, you, when you're doing this. But when we have a screen size, it hasn't actually stretched the image into something really small. It's displaying it really nicely. It's just displaying a bit of it. So it still looks good even at a small screen size. So that's a nice trick when you want to use a background image there. OK. Now we need to bring in some content. So I'm going to have a centered div here, which is going to be six columns wide. So first of all, can you create a new row and a column within that, which is six columns wide? I hope you managed it. All we need to do is create a new div with a class of row. Close that div. And then create a div with a class of column medium device 6. There's another nice trick we can use here from the bootstrap docs. We can use the col MD offset class and what this does is it actually moves the div along slightly so if I use col MD offset 3 then that will move the div with a class of col MD 6 into the center of the page because we're moving it three columns to the right so that's a really useful trick if you want to center things or move things around and then we'll close that div. And in that div, we'll have an h1 tag. And for the moment, we'll just put some text like my awesome app. Hopefully, you'll come up with some better title text. OK, now we've got an issue there. It's actually come up above the space. It is centering nicely, so that's fine. But it is too high up so let's move it down a little bit let's give this another class or no we can give it an ID we'll call it top row so top row we'll just give it a margin at the top of let's try 100 pixels and we'll also center everything. Great. That's starting to look pretty good. So we've got my awesome app there. I think we want that a little bit bigger. So let's go for 200%, see how that looks. Bigger than that, uh, I think we need to actually resize the H1 element, not the top row. So top row h1 whoops let's put font size 300% there great yep i think that looks good 
And as always, just make sure it looks nice when we stretch it out. Fantastic. Do apologize for the flashing there. Now, underneath then, then we need a little bit of text explaining what this app does. There's a nice class in Bootstrap called Lead, which just makes it a little bit larger, a little bit more of a standout piece of text. So this is why you should download this fantastic app. Always best to keep your text really simple, really straight to the point, and really brief. Okay, now we'll have another paragraph with a bit more information about the app. You can go into a little more detail here. if you want to. Okay, nice. I'm liking that. Now we're going to have a form to allow the user to sign up to our mailing list. So just before we do that, let's have a bit of text that encourages the user to do that. Let's give it a class. Just going to make it bold. Okay, interested, join our mailing list. Great. And then we'll have our form. Now how I'd like to do this is a single input with a an at symbol on the left hand side. So we don't have any enter your email or anything like that, we just keep it really simple. So see if you can manage that. Okay, what we do is we have our div class equals input group. We close that div, and then before we put our input, we have our span with a class of input group add-on. Hope you remember that, and we're going to have a symbol at symbol there. Close the span, and now we'll have our input type equals email, class equals form control. And we'll have a placeholder of your email. See how that looks? Nice, I like it. And then we'll have our button. So well, we'll do it as an input type equals submit, class equals btn and btn success. Oh, something's gone a little bit wrong there. That's because I didn't, oh, I know I've put this inside my input group div. We don't want that. Okay, we can actually change the size of our buttons as well, just by saying button LG, that'll give us a nice big button, fantastic. Okay, I'm liking this, I think I want to space it all out a little bit more though, that submit button especially could do with a bit of padding before it, so let's give it another class, I'll give it a class of padding top. Padding top, we want a padding 
Actually, I think we're going to want a margin. Top of, let's say, 30 pixels. Yeah, that looks better. I think I might add that to a couple of others as well. Let's just change the name so it makes a bit more sense. Margin top. Margin top there too. I'm going to add that in to that paragraph tag and also to the form. Just to give everything a bit more space. Great, there we go. I think that looks really nice. I just want to move down the the very top, the My Awesome app there. So let's give the H1 a class of margin top as well. Give it a bit more room. Okay. Excellent. I think that's looking really nice. Now we're going to add a second container with a bit more information about the app. So we move here and we're going to create a new container. Close div there. And what we want is a, a centered row with a nice big bit of text saying something about the app, so why this app is great. So see if you can see if you can do that. Did you manage it? So we have div class of row. Now if it's going to be a full row, we don't need to create any columns inside it. So we'll just have an H1 why this app is awesome. See what happens here. So our div is displaying nicely down there. Um, we do want things centered, I think. So let's let's have a new class of center because we might well be using that again. Let's check that. I suspect we're going to need to give the H1 that class as well. There we go. Great. Now it's difficult to design something while we can't really see what we're what we're dealing with. So it would be great if all of the sort of subsections of the app, the of the page, the rows were all the same height. And it'd be really nice if that was the height of the browser window. So we used our script here already to contain the or set the top container height to the height of the window. So let's have a new class of content container and we'll give that to these containers. And then they'll all be set to the same height. Great. So now we've got um, a lot of room to play with. One issue we're going to have with that is there's a potential that they the height of their of their device is actually smaller than the height of our content. So we can deal with that very easily and change the CSS from height to min height. And that then specifies the minimum height should be equal to the window. And if they happen to have a device which is smaller than our content, then it will the height of the div will just increase um, as needed. So that's looking good. Why this app is awesome, I think I want to play with that a little bit, maybe make it a little bit bigger. And Move it down a touch. So we'll give it a margin top of 100 pixels this time and a font size of, let's try 300%. Okay, that looks good. 
I like that. Okay, carrying on. We now want another bit of lead text. Summary of the app's awesomeness. Great, and we want to make that centered as well. Great. Okay, so that will do for that row. Now we're going to have a second row, which is going to contain three equally equally sized columns on the full width page, and then they're going to be stacked on the mobile version. So have a go at that. Okay, I hope you pulled that off. What we're going to do is create a new row. And then we have a new div of call MD4 because we want three rows. Four goes into 12 three times. Okay, now these rows are going to contain a header. Call it title or header, doesn't really matter. And then some text. So, brief description of one of the best features of your app. Maybe a little more text. Okay, let's just see how that looks. Great. I think I'm going to have that twice because we could do with a little bit more text there. Great. And then we're going to have a call to action. Always good to have a lot of call to actions um, on your site to make it really clear what we want the user to do. So we'll have a button. Button success. And we can make that anything you like. We'll just make it a sign up button. I'd quite like to give that a bit more padding. Let's see how I, how my margin top looks with that. Great. Spaces it out a little bit. I like that. And we're also going to put a glyph icon into the header. So um, why don't you try doing that? Pick a nice glyph icon and pop it in just before the header. All right. I'm going to choose the music glyph icon. So we do span uh, class equals glyph icon and then glyph icon music. Close the span, put in a little space. Great. I like that a lot. Okay. And now if we actually expand that, we can see that, yep, we've got a nice laid out column there. Oh, you'll notice that the button is floating left there. That's because we don't have paragraph tags around our text as we should. Better. Okay, let's create another couple of these. And we'll leave the content the same for now, but I'm going to change the glyph icons to... I'll use the off icon and the pencil icon. Okay, nice. I'm thinking maybe a little bit more padding on top of the divs themselves would be good. So we'll give them the class of margin top. Easily enough. Copy and paste that there. Nice. That spreads it out a little bit more. 
Excellent. And then if we look at it full screen, it still looks great. Okay, so we've got three se uh, two sections to our page so far. Let's add the third. So we want another container div. And let's give it a class of content container as well. So it stretches to the height of the user's screen. I'd like to have a background color for this div. So we get a nice big block of color behind it. So let's give it an ID of footer. And I've saved a nice light blue background color. Just have a little look, see how that looks. Great. I like it. We are going to need a bit of padding there, though. So let's add a margin margin bottom to our not to that div but to that one margin bottom great and then we'll just add a margin bottom of 30 pixels. Great. So that's not too close together. So in this last div, we're simply going to have a nice call to action of to actually download the app. So we'll have a class of row. It's 100% row, so we're not going to put any subdivs within that. And we'll have an H1 of a class of center. Download the app. There we go. I think we want to move it down a little bit like we did before so we can use the same class, um, center and title. Great, and then we'll have a final bit of text. Really, why should I download this app? So your final bit of persuasion there, we definitely want that to be centered as well. Great, and then we need a link to the App Store. Easy enough to, to get one of those. There's lots of icons that you can download and use. So let's have App Store icon in Google Images. I don't really want that one. I want something like that. Great. So just right click on the available on the App Store icon and save it. If we have a look, I've already put it into Bootstrap. Uh, sorry, to yeah, the Bootstrap folder as appstore.png. So very simple. Let's have another paragraph tag with a class of center. And then we'll put our image in there. Appstore.png. Let's give it a size, or well, let's give it a class. App Store image. So we'll go for a width of uh, 250 pixels. See how that looks. Nice. That looks great. I'm just going to move that down a little bit more.
So let's give the top row div a bit of padding at the top. Do I want top row? No, it doesn't sound right. This one. So class equals row. In fact, we could use the footer ID. That would save us having to give that one any more padding. So padding top. Let's try 70 pixels. See how that looks. Pretty good. OK. And then you could add some um, footer text there, just a, um, maybe some Twitter links or a, another contact email address or something like that. But I'll leave that up to you. So now we've got a really nice three stage page. Oh, you'll notice we're missing those. See if you can fix that before I get there. We need to set the width of the footer div to be 100%. That should then stretch it out all the way. Great. So I hope that's given you a taste of how you can use Twitter Bootstrap to create a very attractive landing page very, very quickly. And I'm really keen to look at some of the landing pages that you guys have made, so do give links to them in the forums, and um, I'll come and check them out.